Well, good evening, sisters and brothers, and welcome to our Wednesday uh, edition of week number three of our Gospel of John Bible study. It's good to be with you this evening as we continue along our journey going through the Gospel of John. Tonight we are in chapter four. We're continuing with Jesus' discussion with the woman uh, at the well. Um, before we go any further, I want to say thank you to everybody that came out to the uh, community dinner tonight. Um, we ended up serving 315 uh, plates of Topside chicken. So certainly thanks to Topside for uh, providing the meal and for everybody who came out to work it and survived the rainstorm and all that, all that stuff. It was great to have and see so many people out there. So that's what kind of explains my uh, outfit for tonight. I got a little bit wet standing out there. Didn't get, didn't get home in time to have a shower or anything. So that's why I'm lit it up, as they say. Um, but it's great to be with you guys. Um, continuing on our, our journey. Tonight's a really interesting study, and, and as I was going through it uh, this morning, trying to get ready for tonight, it, it, it was um, interesting to me to see how much it applies to our current situation. Um, the situation being that we're not able to meet in our sanctuaries like we're used to and have become familiar with, but instead we're having to do different ways of worship together. And what's interesting, and I never noticed it before, but Jesus speaks exactly to that, to this woman at the well. In fact, the commentaries I was reading today, that seemed to be the one point they kept on trying to make, is that Jesus was speaking about worship and the proper places to worship. Um, and we'll get into that here in just a little bit. But as we're going through it, uh, in the back of your mind kind of think, well, this is, this is talking about us in, in, in 2020. Um, Great to have you guys with us. As always, the disclaimer, it'll be all the lessons are saved here on the Facebook page. They'll also be saved over on the YouTube channel. So if you miss uh, a little bit of tonight, if you got to leave early, whatever it is, if you come in late, uh, if you missed last night or the night before, it's fine. You'll know, catch up uh, at your leisure as we continue on through our study of the Gospel of John. But in order to get our hearts and minds in a proper posture for tonight, I want to invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. Father, as I come before you tonight, I'm so very aware of my own prayerlessness. I think and worry about so much, but pray about so little in comparison. Forgive me, Lord. By the work of the Holy Spirit within me, teach me to pray and to do so continually. I ask also, Lord, for my church community. May my brothers and sisters in Christ be full of joy as they Wait on you in the midst of trials that they are experiencing, and may they be faithful in prayer. Remove from our lives all things that hinder our prayers, unbelief, sin that we have not turned from, unforgiveness, and may we respond to every prompting of the Holy Spirit that we might be unfettered and pray with all of our hearts. Father, I ask that fervency in prayer and intercession be released on us that we might become a true house of prayer for all nations. Replace prayerlessness within our fellowship here with a passionate longing to see your church revived. May prayer become the fuel of the Holy Spirit among us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that we that gather this night would become those who always pray and never give up. May we be found faithful when you come, Lord Jesus. May we be those that you call upon by the Spirit to watch on the wall for your church, for cities, and even nations. I ask that you stir our hearts with an urgency to pray and give us full of faith, God-sized dreams and requests. Teach us to pray your heart. Teach us to pray your word. May the men and women of our congregation lead their families on their knees in prayer. May the men and women of our fellowship here humble themselves before you and be self-controlled so that they can pray with greater boldness. Raise up intercessors among the youth of our faith communities. Grab hold of their hearts, I pray, and fill them with great faith. May our hearts and minds be set on the things of your kingdom. Teach us to pray, Lord. From youngest to oldest, teach us to pray. We do these things, I ask, so that we, your church, your sons and daughters, might come alive by the Spirit and be allowed the privilege of participating in the harvest that is coming. Even this day, O oh God, call your people to humility, to turn from sin, to seek your face. Wake us up from our slumber, O oh God, for surely time is short. 
In the name of him who lives to intercede for me, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so continuing on in chapter 4 of the Gospel of John. Tonight we'll cover verses 16 through 26, verses 16 through 26. And we are still at the part where Jesus is having his discussion with the Samaritan woman, or what is sometimes referred to as the woman at the well. We talked about on Monday how he, he was determined to make his way through Samaria, even though there were geographically other ways he could get from where he was to where he was going. He was doing this theologically. He had an evangelistic mindset because he wanted to go see this woman and talk to her. We talked about the distinctions or the contrast between the Nicodemus story of last week and the woman's story of this week. And then last night, the woman is basically saying, you know, Monday night, Jesus asked her for a drink. Last night, she was saying how ridiculous the request was. And then Jesus said, well, if you even knew who was making the request, you would be asking me for a drink because the water that I can give is living water. You know, if you drink from this well, the stagnant water here, you will, you will continue to be thirsty. If you drink from the living water, you will never be thirsty. So this is a continuation of that conversation of last night. So we pick it up, John chapter 4, verses 16 through 26. And St. John writes these words. He told her, and again, nine times out of ten in the Gospels, he is Jesus, as it is in this case. But he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I... The one speaking to you. So Dr. Witherington then uh, tells us this about these, these verses. He says, The dialogue takes a sudden left turn when Jesus, apparently out of the blue, tells the woman to go back to town, call her husband, and come back again. Her reply is honest, but does not tell the whole story. Jesus, the one who knows what is in a person's heart, says, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. One can imagine the woman's eyes getting big as she blurts out, You must be a prophet. And notice then, she immediately changes the subject. This is so true of human nature. When people touch a sore spot in our lives, we don't want to talk about it, so we change the subject. And indeed, as the dialogue goes on, the story will shift from focusing on who she truly is to who he is truly is. Interestingly, she changes the subject from her own ethics to theology and the worship wars between Jews and Samaritans in regard to where was the appropriate place to truly worship the one true God. Samaritans were monotheists, but precisely because the Pentateuch was their only scripture, the first five books of the Old Testament, they believed in one holy mountain in the Holy Land, not Mount Zion, but rather Mount Gerizim. The woman assumes that true worship is a matter of being on the right high place, the right mount, in the right sacred zone. It is interesting that Jesus suggests to her that while the Samaritans are worshiping the right God, they don't really know who it is they are worshiping. It is a comment one might make today about other monotheists who do not know their Savior. Jesus says the reason the woman doesn't know who she worships is because salvation is from the Jews, and more specifically, from the Jewish Messiah standing right in front of her. 
Jesus says that true worship is not about finding the proper sacred space or zone, but about the way one worships, in the spirit and in truth. True worship both evokes the lively presence of God himself and it involves the conveyance of truth. It has both a cognitive and an affective dimension, or in other words, your heart and your mind. It is the place where head and heart are both engaged in the praise and adoration of the Maker and Savior. The main reason Jesus gives for this definition of true worship is because God is spirit. God in the divine nature has no body and requires no physical space like a temple in which to be kept. God cannot be confined by time or space. The character of worship is determined by the object of that worship and should agree with the character of the God who is worshipped. So it is not about sacred space, but sacred times and sacred persons. The Samaritans did have a concept of a Messiah, but they thought he would be a prophet like Moses, based upon the prophecy in the book of Numbers. The star prophecy there was the basis of Samaritan messianic hopes. And notice that it has nothing to do with David and his descendants, only with Jacob and his offspring. Jesus, however, is prepared to say to the woman, the one whom you are expecting has arrived, and you are talking with him now. This prompts a sudden exit, stage right, which we'll get to tomorrow. All right, a few things to point out about our story here um, that I discovered when I was getting ready. And I found this interesting. It says, the woman's personal history with men probably sp symbolizes spiritual adultery. As the following verses show, Jesus has come to introduce the true worship of God for all. Surprised by Jesus' knowledge, the woman identifies him as a prophet, which is a step beyond Sir and on the way to Messiah. So as this woman is having this conversation with Jesus, first he's Sir, then he's a prophet. And as we'll see later on this week, she comes to recognize him as the Messiah. Samaritans believe that Mount Gerizim, not Jerusalem, was God's designated place to worship. Jesus speaks of a future time when God, who is spirit, will be appropriately worshipped in spirit and truth, not linked to any particular location. Because Jesus, the truth of God, has come baptizing with the spirit of God, the future is now. True worship of God is possible anywhere for those who have embraced Jesus as Messiah and received the Spirit. Right? Worship is possible anywhere for those who have embraced Jesus as Messiah and received the Spirit. And this is a point I, I think is interesting as well. When Jesus says that I am he, those words in Greek can also be translated as I am, which is a reference back to the book of Exodus when Moses asks God, you know, roughly what his name is, and God says, tell them I am who I am, or I am as being the name of God. So here Jesus is roughly saying, yes, I am also, or I am the divine. I am. I find it interesting. Um, also interesting is about this part about true worship being possible anywhere. This is what kind of leads me to think about our, our, the time and place we are right now, and that our sanctuaries are closed Yet we are finding true places of worship in other ways, whether it be through a Facebook Live video, a recorded worship service, our drive-in worship services, gathering amongst a, a few people through a Zoom call or, or, or a, a Google Hangout, whatever it is. We're finding different ways to worship. And while it may not be what we're used to, it does not make them any less authentic, right? I think what Jesus is trying to say here, so long as we are embracing our Savior and our Creator God and we are worshiping earnestly and heartfeltly, then I don't want to say it doesn't matter where you are, but it doesn't matter where you are. Whether it be in a sanctuary, in, in, a, in a parking lot, in your car, watching on Facebook, worship is not so much about where you are, but is who it is that you are worshiping. What's the object of your worship? In that respect, true worship can take place. Holy worship can take place anywhere that you find yourself. I want to read this to you as well that I found, which I thought was pretty good. It says that Jesus' request for her to call her husband marks a turn in the narrative. His knowledge of her private life causes her to realize that he is a prophet. Some see verse 20 as a diversion tactic on the woman's part. Another and better reading is having a bona fide prophet before her 
The woman wants to have a serious theological conversation, and they do. When comparing her discourse with Nicodemus' discourse, it is clear who comes off looking more theologically astute. She starts the conversation with a question about the where or place of worship. Jews and Samaritans had different holy sites, and there is a complicated and antagonistic history behind these sites. While Jesus' response focuses on the how of worship, it becomes clear the who of worship is the main point. Chapter 2 in John has already shown that Jesus is the temple, his body is the temple, the place of encounter with God. Jesus says that God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and truth. True worship begins with seeing Jesus as the truth and the one who gives the spirit. As chapter 7 will make clear, the water that Jesus has in mind is the Holy Spirit. In a gospel often accused of being anti-Semitic, it is important to hear verse 22 because salvation is from the Jews. The Savior is a Jew, not a Samaritan, but the preposition is important. Salvation is from the Jews inasmuch as the Messiah came from the Jewish people. But as the next verses are about to make clear, salvation is for all people. The woman next turns to another major theological topic, that of the Messiah. Samaritans had a different view of the Messiah than Jews, probably focused more on the prophet like Moses spoken of in Deuteronomy. She believes that Messiah will be the one who reveals all things. As it turns out, the Messiah is sitting in front of her and does just what she said Messiah should do. In the first of a series of I am statements in God's, John's gospel, Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah. Jesus may suggest even more. As the text literally reads, I am the one who is speaking to you. The I am may be an allusion to the divine name of God given in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And then also this. It says that Christ commands her to call her husband. It would seem the Lord changed the subject. That is not true. In order for the woman to understand the living water concept, she must be aware of her need for that living water. Christ now begins to arouse her conscience and sense of guilt. Before anyone can be saved, he or she must see the need of their salvation and be convicted of their sin. So again, what need do we have of a Savior if we don't understand our sin problem? So what it's saying here is that what Jesus is trying to do is it's not so much a diversionary tactic on Jesus' part, but it's her try, him trying to get her to see where she may be falling short. And then thus her need for salvation through this Jewish Messiah. Christ reveals her sinful condition. She was morally bankrupt. She acknowledges Christ as a prophet and in so doing admits her personal sin, which Christ revealed. The woman now desires to be taught by the prophet. And then she asks, should worship be at Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem? Christ reveals to the woman that where a person worships is unimportant. It's not limited to Mount Gerizim or to Jerusalem. The Samaritans worshipped what they did not know. They had created their own religion. The Jews had divine guidelines for worship. Nevertheless, the hour has come, and now is when God is to be worshipped in both spirit and truth. Two separate concepts here are implied. The worship of the Father is not confined to a place, but is rather an action of the heart. Second, all worship must be in keeping with the truth of God's revealed word. God is a spirit. Spirit, the predicate, is mentioned first to emphasize the spiritual character of God. Notice the emphasis on the must of that type of worship. The knowledge of Christ causes the woman to talk about Messiah. She is still confused and resolves this confusion by, confusion by admitting that the Messiah will tell all things. I that speak unto thee am he. This is when Jesus says, I am the one whom you seek. The woman claimed that the only person who could answer her questions were in doubt was the Messiah. What a surprise. This type of messianic revelation would have been dangerous in Jerusalem, but in this sitting, sitting at, setting at the well, Jesus deemed it safe. The Samaritan woman first saw a Jew, then a prophet, and then finally the Messiah. So again, he goes from being sir to a prophet to a Messiah, all through this conversation that, that Jesus has with this woman. So a couple of things I think to point out uh, in these 10 verses that are extraordinary. One, 
Um, where you worship doesn't matter. It's how are you worshiping and who are you worshiping. And Jesus is setting that up fairly clearly in, in, this, in, this, in these uh, verses. Also, Jesus is referring to himself as the great I am, which up to this point, we, we've talked about before how in the Gospel of John, that contains Jesus' I am statements. I think there's about seven of them total. This is the first one. And it's very simple. I am, right? Just like God refers to God's self as I am in the book of Exodus. So Jesus is doing it here because Jesus is, after all, God in, in human form. So that matter where you worship, it's about who you worship and how you worship. And Jesus identifying himself as the divine uh, in, in this passage. So that just about brings us to a close tonight. I want to read, like we always do, our devotion that corresponds with these two, uh, these ten, rather, I should say, verses. Um, and our, our uh, devotion writer says these things. He says, We should mark the absolute necessity of conviction of sin before a soul can be converted to God. So again, this is where Jesus tells the woman, uh, Go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. Jesus, Well, I know you had five, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband either. He's trying to show her where her, her sin is located says, the Samaritan woman seems to have been comparatively unmoved until our Lord exposed her breach of the seventh commandment. Those heart-searching words, go call thy husband, appear to have pierced her conscience like an arrow. From that moment, however ignorant, she speaks like an earnest, sincere inquirer after the truth. And the reason is evident. She felt that her spiritual disease was discovered for the first time in her life, she saw herself. To bring thoughtless people to this state of mind should be the principal aim of all teachers and ministers of the gospel. They should carefully copy their master's example in this place. Till men and women are brought to feel their sinfulness and need, no real good is ever done to their souls. Till a sinner sees himself as God sees him, he will continue careless, trifling, and unmoved. Never does a soul value the gospel medicine until it feels its disease. Never does a man see any beauty in Christ as a Savior until he discovers that he is himself a lost and ruined sinner. Ignorance of sin is invariably attended by neglect of Christ. We should mark the uselessness of any religion which only consists of formality. The Samaritan woman, when awakened to spiritual concern, started questions about the comparative merits of the Samaritan and Jewish modes of worshiping God. Our Lord tells her that true and acceptable worship depends not on the place in which it is offered, but on the state of the worshiper's heart. The heart is the principal thing in all our approaches to God. The Lord looketh on the heart, as it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. The feeblest gathering of three or four poor believers in a cottage to read the Bible and pray is a more acceptable sight to him who searches the heart than the fullest congregation which is ever gathered in St. Peter's at Rome. So what's he telling us here? He'd rather us to be deep than be wide, right? It matters not if you have a sanctuary full to the rafters of people if they're not there to worship the way they should be worshiping. If it's not truly in their heart to come to worship service, to worship God, not to be there to be part of any kind of a show, but to worship the one who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Bring God all of our praises and thankfulness for the good things. Bring God all of our petitions and burdens when times are tough. We'd much rather be deep than be wide. All right, friends, so that'll draw us to a close tonight. Um, we'll continue on chapter four tomorrow night, seven o'clock. Again, we're live Monday through Friday, seven o'clock right here. One thing I also want to talk about just real brief is that tomorrow is set aside as our national day of prayer. And if you're following me right now, watching this, then you've done all that you need to do tomorrow from noon until one, I'm going to have here live on my Facebook page, a virtual prayer room. And what does that mean? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the candles lit, the lights on in our sanctuary, music playing in the background for an hour. And what I want you to do is to uh, log in and, and watch the video, but, but use that video as, as more of a, a quiet place to pray. If you have a specific prayer request, then I want you to type it in the comment section and I'll see it. I'll be on the other side of the camera, but I'll see all the comments as they come in and be able to uh, pray for those requests as they come in. 
If you have something that you'd rather keep just between me and you, and a few of you have done this already, send me an email or send me a text or send me a private message. And then what I'll do is I'll print those out and place them on the altar and pray over those tomorrow as well. What we're really trying to do is try to create a space for all of us to kind of you know, get together as you have time for an intentional uh, area, an intentional space for us to pray uh, during this National Day of Prayer that is set aside for tomorrow. So again, that's from 12 to 1. You don't have to be present for the whole hour. If you just want to drop in, pray for a bit, and then and pop out, that's fine. But for that hour, it'll be our altar. It'll be candles lit, music in the background, hopefully a, a reverent and prayerful space for you to be able to maybe devote a few minutes of your day in contemplative prayer. We talk often about coming to God in a uncomfortable, if not holy silence. Well, it won't be necessarily that silent because there'll be music playing in the background, but hopefully it'll be a place for you to be able to, to you know, calm yourself and, and, and connect with God uh, prayerfully. And again, send me your request for prayer in the comment section or email, text, or private message me your prayer request that you may have uh, for tomorrow. All right, so, so that goes on tomorrow, 12 until 1. Then tomorrow night, 7 o'clock back here, uh, continuing, continuing on John uh, chapter 4 and Jesus and his conversation with the woman at the well. Uh, but until then, I want us to close in prayer as we always do. So I want to invite you now to bow your head and close your eyes as we pray together. Let us pray. O oh, divine love, as you stand outside the closed doors of human hearts and knock, Grant me the grace to throw open all the doors of my heart. Tonight, let me draw back every bolt and bar that until now has robbed my life of air and light and love. Open my ears, O oh God, so that I can hear your voice calling me to attempt great things. Too often when you have spoken to me, I have been deaf to your appeals. But now give me the courage to answer, here I am, send me. Help me to hear when any of my human brothers and sisters, your children, call out in need. Help me to hear your voice in their cry. Open my mind, O oh God, so that I may welcome any new insights or knowledge that you wish to give me. May I not cling to the past so tightly that I limit the life ahead of me. Give me courage to change my mind when that is needed. Help me to be tolerant to the thoughts of others and open to the truths they may teach me. Open my eyes, O oh God, so that I may see you in your wonderful creation around me. Let all lovely things fill my heart with joy, and may they turn my mind to your everlasting loveliness. Forgive me for the times when I have been blind to the grandeur and glory of creation, the charm of little children, and the beauty of human lives, and so have failed to see you in all these reminders of your presence. Open my hands, O oh God hands ready to share with others all the blessings you have so richly given me. Deliver me from all mean and selfish instincts. All my money is yours, and all my possessions belong to you. Help me to be a faithful steward of your generosity. All honor and glory be to you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, my friends, I hope you have a restful Wednesday night. A wonderful Thursday, and I will see you at noon to one for our virtual prayer room. And then, of course, again, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, for the continuation of our Bible study in the Gospel of John. Until then, God bless.